I guess just to introduce you to so Charles, this is Paul. Paul, this is Charles. Hi. Charles is a been in the data science field for he's a you know veteran and you know he's knows his way around uh, data. And Charles Paul is getting correct me if I'm wrong, a master's in data science. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Why don't you uh, introduce your, uh, yourselves? Um, so, sure. Uh, okay, I can go first, Charles. Um, yeah, pleasure to meet you. Uh, yeah, I'm just wrapping up a master's in data science from uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, I'm a data scientist at General Motors. I work in our uh, global vehicle safety uh, division, and uh, we use vehicle telematics to try and. Uh, uncover safety issues with vehicles before our our uh, customers experience those things um, to the best to the greatest extent that we can um, I'm part of a pretty large team there's about a dozen data scientists on the team um, we're kind of split between unstructured data and structured data we do a lot of um, text analysis of customer feedback and technician feedback from uh, from dealership services so we look at that data, um, and then we also use OnStar, our telematics data, to try and understand what's going on with customers' vehicles. So that's kind of my my background in data science. Before that, I was uh, I got my start in business intelligence. Um, before that, in IT project management, and before that, I was an officer in the Air Force for a while. So uh, that's a bit about my background. Okay. Um <clears throat> So yeah, I've, um, I'm Charles, and I've um, been a programmer for like over 27 years. Uh -huh. And um, I'm kind of the last year, year and a half, I've been getting into data science. Um, I took some graduate level classes in machine learning uh, in the early 2000s, and um, so and uh, I worked for Ford on a system <laughs> that tested vehicles at the end of the assembly line and would it would detect defects yeah yeah okay i know exactly we have the same thing at gm they right as they come off the line they you plug them in and run all kinds of diagnostic tests on it so i'm sure it's the same type of thing yeah so are you in detroit yeah i'm just north i'm about uh i'd say about an hour north of detroit yeah okay i went to wayne state oh yeah my wife uh she well she did some of her schooling there um i've been down to wayne state a couple times for some uh, predictive analytics conferences. So yeah, good school. Yeah, yeah, I got a degree in math from there. Okay, um, did, uh, so are you from here, uh, Southeast Michigan? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in like Detroit, Roseville, Detroit. <laughs> My wife grew up in Roseville. <laughs> 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 yeah, she grew up in Roseville. She's um, Middle Eastern by descent and her family emigrated in the early 80s and she went to Roseville High School and everything, so, uh, yeah. I went to Fraser High. I was like at the north end of Roseville. <laughs> okay, wow, such a small world. Are you still in Southeast Michigan or are you somewhere else now? I'm in Portland, Oregon. Oh, okay, so you're just in the same neck of the woods as Keegan then, around yeah. close, yeah, okay. All right, that's cool. That was, it's good to meet oh. you, it's a small world, huh? It is. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny because both of you seem to have uh, uh, deep uh, programming backgrounds. I'm I'm more of a hacker. I, I try to do whatever I can to try and get the answer I'm finding. Uh, but it sounds like you guys are uh, pretty uh, pretty experienced developers. Well, you know, it's just tools for the trade. So you know, you've got a task at hand. So yeah, yeah. it's awesome to see you using the tools. And then yeah. Yeah, and like whenever you're doing anything new, you end up sort of hacking around anyway to figure it out, and then exactly, so yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, here at, at GM, um, we use, um, you know, we use Python, PySpark. We have in a Hadoop environment because our data sets are so large, um, so we kind of we're usually using Jupyter Labs uh, environment for to work in that environment, um, and then um, some of our desktop. Uh, kind of exploratory analysis is done in R. Um, and I, I tend to lean more towards R, although it's not as popular as Python, but for me, it's a little easier. So that's why I tend to lean towards the R side of the house. But um, um, yeah, no, so it's, yeah, all good, good. It's good to 
I just can't believe that you're actually from Roseville. That blows me away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, figure the odds. So, so I guess you wanted, I guess I'm just real curious about you, I guess your, your use with big data because we're, we've been having a bit of, so like, well, that's one of the things, one of our tasks at hand is working with big data, in particular this large Washington state data. So yeah. I'm just curious what, what's been your experience? Um, I pointed you in the direction of the sales data and you seem to read it in without any trouble. So is R pretty powerful for that? Or? I, I, I didn't have any real big problems. I just used, um, so in R, uh, there's a packet, there's a, a group of packages called the Tidyverse. Um, and that's what I lean lean towards. Um, and I just read it in using the, the C, read CSV function. And I read in like the first 20,000 rows just to sort of take a look or take a peek. And it read right in fine. And that's a large data set too. I forgot how many gigabytes that is. But I, I didn't have any trouble. My machine, I think I have, um, uh, I'm not sure. I have to check, check how much uh, RAM I've got in here. But it didn't really... Didn't really have a I didn't really have a problem just you know taking a peek. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm glad you started to get a look at that, and yeah, it's, it's, ten, or what you gonna say or? Oh, I'm sorry. I keep. Uh, I think it might be a little rag lag. I'm uh, hopefully I'm not in, interrupting you too much. Um, no, I um, so I printed out. Where is it? Yeah, I printed out like. You know the the data set, um, the Washington uh, the Washington data set, the user manual, like the table of contents, just to sort of learn my way around all the different table names and try to get used to like the business logic that is required of the system. You know to run a run the different types of businesses. You know whether you're a producer or if you're a lab or anything like that, um, and just trying to get familiar with some of those things. What I did, what I would like to try and take a shot at oh and let me back up real quick for the benefit of charles um so i reached out to keegan last week actually i just stumbled onto this meetup um and uh i'm wrapping up my my graduate program and i have to do a graduate project and i was trying to figure out you know, what am i going to do um and i have some uh, family members are actually involved in in the business uh, and i i kind of have a kind of periphery view of that but i thought well is there something I could do for my project? Um, so I reached out to Keegan and he was kind enough to talk with me and give me some ideas and maybe some questions I could try to answer with the data. Um, so that's why I've kind of, you know, the last week or so I've been trying to dig into the data set and try to understand it the, you know, as best I could with the amount of time I've had. But, um, but yeah, so one of the things I wanted to do is, it may be a waste of time depending on what work you guys have already done, but for me, I, it would be nice if there was an like an entity relationship diagram of the tables, so know how all the different keys are related and how all these different fields um, are connected within the different tables. Um, and so I was thinking about taking a shot at doing something like that based on what I could scrape out of the, the um, user guide um, and sort of have this, this big picture map of what's going on in the data. I don't know if if you think it's a worthwhile thing or something you've already done or, or maybe it's a, a lot of extra I like I like how you think. I think that needs to be done because I think at the moment I just have this vague mental map about how IDs connect. But that's, you know, it's better to formalize things because then you can actually have it down on paper and you can actually start to see all of the connections. So I think that needs to be done. Um, it's all essentially based on global IDs. So each each object, for the most part, has a global ID, um, and so it's all about sort of tracing. Yeah, I guess tracing those, but it'll be for well. Actually, I can. Um, it's 
Well, so, so basically what I was working on right now is essentially mapping. So the first connection was just mapping the the lab result. For me, I started with lab results. So I was just mapping the lab result to the licensee. Mm -hmm. um, and so that one, I guess you would just say the connection was, would be like the four MME ID of the lab result ID. Here, I'll, sh I'll share my screen and kind of sure. show you what I'm talking about. So one thing, every table has a global ID. Okay. But those global IDs are actually, a, the, uh, it's actually it's it's actually the record ID for for that for that entry in the table. It's so like the sales table has a global ID, but that's actually a sales ID, and the lab results ID has a global ID, but that's actually the lab result ID. <laughs> <laughs> and so okay. you try and combine those tables, and there's always this conflict that there's you know every table has a global ID. So I think one thing to do to, you know, is to go through and like rename those. Okay. Okay. So there is more of a local ID to the table in question. Um, and then linking those ideas. I mean, I, I assume that, you know, on some of these tables, they have ID sharing, right? So you would have a global ID from a, I'm just looking at the list here from, I'm making an example, a global ID from the sales table would also show up in the, uh, sales item table right to make that linkage so okay i see what you're saying so there needs to be some distinctions made uh between that global id that they actually are are specific to the table that they're embedded in right Ooh. yeah and that would actually making a map of you know, you know sort of schema map of the tables that would be great that would uh, that would be helpful because they're they are linked you know like the lab result ID shows up or the global ID that's in the lab results shows up as the lab result ID in the in the inventories okay <laughs> yeah and until you <laughs> until you get it all down uh, and can see it all laid out it uh, I mean they, they they have that in the, um, the the user guide but it's not a very obviously not a very practical way to look at it but um okay yeah go, go ahead Keegan oh I was I I think you both have a very good mental framework and we've both all come to the conclusion that we need to map this out, but I was just going to show you an example. So here you found the data. So pretty much the core is the licensees, right? So they're sort of what I think of as like the core object. Um, so here, you know, you just have just a given licensee. And I think this is what Charles hit at, which I kind of like that idea is, so here you have sort of a global ID for the license. It, you deal with a lot of global IDs along the way. So, you know, we may want to, I guess that's also maybe called the MME ID. So we may want to, Make, so that was maybe an idea is to just make, make our own formalization of what to call that. But um, but we can think about what that. Is, what is the format of that ID? You got uh, WAWA1 dot and then something else after that. Is that a typical formatting of the ID? I think it's... I think it's usually just, well, it looks like it's maybe begins with MM. So that's probably like, you know, I'm not 100% certain for the abbreviation, maybe like medical marijuana or something. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like followed by just a random. Uh, looks, looks like it increments through one through nine and then. With, with, oh, and then it, exactly. So just. Okay. Uh, Alpha okay. counter. Yeah, and there's a different format for like labs, for producers. Um, ah, okay. Um, and this is another interesting point is the this is not, this 
the code is essentially their license number. Um, so let's like look at a lab result real quick. Um, so I just read in the lab result. Um, so there's a lot of data here, but Okay, so, so essentially, I guess, oh, uh, I guess we can talk about the IDs more in a second, but just to hit on it real quick, the way I was able to connect these was basically say, okay, so the lab results, you know, has this field that's, you know, for MME ID. And so that is the global ID of the you know the license data and so you know you're able to sort of merge the data you know on those two and so i think that's where you were talking about. okay i think that's where you were talking about we can maybe start to create like a, a visual of you know the actual um like, like a bit right of the there word abstraction but what were you going to say? Yeah. No, what I, um, so I just found this online utility where I took the, um, the user guide and it tries to convert it like PDF files and tries to convert it into a table. So obviously where there's all the text and everything in the user guide, it has a bunch of just like line after line if you import it into like Excel. Um, but then the tables themselves with a little bit of minimal, minimal cleanup, um, I, could, I can extract those tables and make them their own CSV files. And then there was another online utility I found that you can feed in CSV files and it will try to join the tables together as best it can based on common field naming. Mm. Um, and that might get us part of the way there. We haven't tried it yet, but that might get us part of the way there to speed it up because obviously going through and trying to map things manually is not the optimal way of doing it. But there may be, I don't know, what do you guys think of that idea? Um, honestly, I think, I think it's worth a stab just to try it. However, Actually, oh yeah, we have the, the data guide here. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's I think it's worth a stab. I think ultimately we're just going to have to get in here though and just sort of match up the main fields. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because like the licensee global ID is the four. M E M E I D. Yeah. Um, right. There's you know, it doesn't match the global ID in the in in the lab results. That's I mean, Panda so has a really hard time with this, and I have yeah. to name things. Right. Well, at the very least, I'll go through the exercise. I mean, it's a good exercise for me to go through to, for familiar, familiar familiarity reasons, right? to go through and scrape the tables out of the document, put them into like a CSV file that I could share with you guys. Um, and, you know, you could, we could then start, if we need to go through and do some manual mapping, we could do that too, but at least it will give us a common, like a common data file, a common worksheet that we could collaborate on or, or, or whatever. Um, so, so what I, I, th I, I think that would be incredibly helpful, Paul, because basically any stab we can, any way we can try to connect this data, the better. Because I think it's worth a go, because what do we have here? We've got about, I don't know, a dozen or two dozen, more than a dozen, so maybe two dozen, a whole like data sets here. And mm -hmm. they're all loosely connected and I think just first would be just a nice mental map. So what I'm imagining is almost yeah. just 
you know, you can do it a little cleaner, but just like just a real quick stab at it. You could just almost just do something like, you know, you've got the licensees here mm -hmm. and, you know, they've got some data. But, you know, they maybe connect up and, I'm, and we can think about how we want to visualize this. But basically, you know, we'd basically show that, oh, you know, licensees, you know, connect to, you know, lab results. And then this would be like, you know, from. So this is just real quick and dirty, but yeah, you know, and you could just sort of have arrows. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that would just be a good starting point. I know that for for my school projects, um, I have to be able to account for like you know the data set that I'm using, how I made sense of it, and those types of things. So I would have to go through some of this exercise anyway. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I could I could take a stab at the you know take a first pass to see how far I get, and for next time uh, when we come together, I can show you guys what I have up to that point. And feel free to bounce things off me when questions off. Uh, well, the group really, Charles too, he's uh, gotten pretty deep into this data as well because the, the matching game is tricky. So. For example, let's look at this lab result ID real quick. Um, oh, here we go. This is what I was looking for. This inventory ID is, is critical as well. Um, so this inventory ID may actually be better than the for MME ID. So, so the, see the for MME ID, you know, connect to the global ID here. But if you look at the inventory ID, if you split the WA to the period, do you see that? Now, that yeah yeah that is a license's code and so that's basically their license number and that's an important number on its own i think you can navigate the system you know through mme ids however it, you may actually sort of have better luck. Well, actually, it, it, they're for tracking different things, right? So this is for tracking the licensee, and then this is actually for tracking a particular inventory item. Um, right. But, but, but long story short, you know, this is a, this is an important ID as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously the benefit of, of, going through some of this mapping is that um, it, it puts everybody on the, like the experience that you and Charles have had so far, you've kind of figured out some of these relationships. Um, but if we had it documented somewhere, um, and it makes it easier to share and collaborate and um, kind of speak the same language. Yeah, no, that would be really helpful. Because yeah, it all is sort of in my head and I have to remember. Yeah, you know, and sometimes I take a few days off from working on this, and then I have to go back and think, oh, this is how it all put together. It's a, right. It's always the case. You asked me something I coded, uh, you know, five days ago, and you might as well be talking to a wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is something that's been a long time coming because I, I just, yeah, it's just a brilliant idea because we all just have these sort of 
mental maps about, oh, yeah, like, so for example, you know, when I was coding this up, I was like, oh, you know, I just sort of looked at the data and I was like, okay, you know, this sort of matches global ID to MME ID. Mm -hmm. However, if we had just almost not just this connection, but if we had the whole web, that way we could see, oh, you know, this ID connects to this ID. Right, so, that right. way, so that way we could connect. Okay, so that way we can connect the licensee to the lab result. And then, you know, what if we could also then, you know, connect. Oops. You know, what if we could then, you know, connect this lab result up to sales, essentially. Exactly, exactly right uh, you can answer a, a lot more okay. interesting questions if you just know the lay of the land yeah exactly and i don't even know really the first thing about sales so for example well just since the spirit of the data science group is actually look at the data let's actually look at the script from last week where i were we reading in sales last week? Um, no. 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 Um, maybe that was something I was doing on my own. Um, but but no, have no fear. We can go to the documentation. Uh, by the way, I just saw your, your Canalytics logo on there. That was pretty cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so... But so, okay, here, here is a sales data point. And so, what, as you'll see, once again, we've got the, the pesky global ID, well, or the, or the, uh, the helpful global ID, whichever. Um, if you're the glass half full uh, type of person. <laughs> so, like Charles was saying, so this is sort of my inclination, but so there's a pro and the con. So my inclination would be to just call this a sales ID. Mm -hmm. And that's just what we'll in, you know, internally refer to it as. So table nine, table name yeah. underscore ID. It, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so sales under, and so let's see if that would work for the most part. So I don't think taxes are in there, but um, so sales are the big one. Maybe we can get plants and see if we can incorporate some sort of plant to like, I would call that like plant ID inventory right. type uh, ID, mm -hmm. lab result ID, sure. licensee ID. And, and then the inventory transfer ID, yep. batch, yep. I, batch ID. So that's what I would do, inventory. But the, just to go ahead and you know, play devil's advocate, that that's introducing yet like yet a whole nother variable into the um, <laughs> into the mix of variables, but um, you know to counter that you know it, it's just it can be nice to just add a little structure to you know add a you know a bit more schema is always nice. Well, you you have to do that at some point because if you try and combine you know, um, entries from the lab results and the inventories, they both have a, they both have a global ID, but they're not the same global ID. And then pandas, you know, tries to thinks, well, it's a global ID. So it's all, you know, it, you know, it's all the same column, but it's not. So you have to go back and you have to go through and rename them anyway, at some point, if you want to, if you want to do analysis using more than one table. Exactly. I, I was just curious for the files that um, Keegan that you've collected up to this point. Um, it, I might be tracking off the subject a little bit, but uh, 
you mentioned previously that there's a Freedom of Information Act that you had to use to get all this data. Is that correct? Or did they already have this stuff posted out there? Um, so I'll share this link with you. So this is essentially the way to go about things. So if you go to here we are so if you go to the lcb.wa.gov slash records slash make you know dash public dash request records request they've basically got this set of um you know guidelines so basically just you know you submit your information in sort of the data you're seeking. Mm. Um, so, you, you know, you, um, and, so, and so it may be helpful. Um, so this was shared with me, to, with me by someone who just does sort of monthly records requests. So they're just each month just getting all the latest data. Mm -hmm. And so it actually, so this, you know, it just goes up through December. So it'd be worthwhile to yeah have a, to do another records request. I'm not a hundred percent certain like how fast they're able to turn around the data, but you can probably get like up to like the last month. So or the everything up to before the prior month. So let's say this month is May. I wouldn't be surprised if you could get everything up through March, um, through the end of March. Um, uh, but I, you know, I just haven't. Uh, I haven't gone about making a re records request for the latest data myself. And they they published all that out on their kind of public access point, huh? For... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we do something similar with government data. Um, so the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, they public a lot, publish a lot of um, uh, public databases on um, vehicle accidents and uh, complaints from customers. And we actually scrape that data and ingest it, um, but that we do that daily for General Motors because they update it daily. But I don't know what your long-term vision is, Keegan, for, for the Canalytics uh, company, but if you're thinking about aggregation across states or something like that, um, you'd want to think about, you know, some some formalized uh, ETL type tools or whatever to ingest it and consolidate it. But uh, back to our mapping schema, um, you know, whatever we end up calling, you know, if we call these different these different IDs by their table name and all that stuff, that would be part of your formal, your formal definition of map. Um, as you ingest them, you can then trans, you know, translate the fields to whatever it is that you're, you know, you want to use. Um, and then they would be like, you know, uh, data ready to use after you in, ingest them. But uh, you, kind of you've actually hit, you've hit on a brilliant idea. So essentially, that's something that essentially I sort of started fiddling with um, over here because you're right. So we're essentially going to need a formal schema for all the data. So, so that's actually something that you're right, that so Kinlytics is sort of setting about this. So the way I'm approaching this is I'm trying to essentially consolidate the two main traceability systems. So you've got LEAF here, mm -hmm. and then you've got yeah. metric over here. And that's the one Michigan it uses metric. I, I haven't done much digging around yet, but as I find out more about how to access Michigan's metric data, um, I'll Obviously, I'll share that with you. So that's so. I'm not 100 percent sure 
if you can actually get um, you know public metric data, but um, but essentially just you know to sort of I was sort of just was sort of looking at this just to try to consolidate these names here. So let's see. So let's just like look at these two side by side. So like here would be, well, this is a delivery. Hold on. This is like an actual sale. And if, if you were, like when you were working in your lab environment and you were running APIs, obviously, well, I say obviously, but you have to be a license holder in order to access the data, right? Yes, 100%. So, well, it, well, in Washington State, you can do the Freedom of Information Act. And that's just the, it's sort of funny how that works, but it's just, but that's like historic data. But to get sort of the, you know, the live active data, mm -hmm. you, yes, you have to be a license holder or technically the, um, there are software companies that are verified integrators with the state, provide software services to the companies. Um, and then they can actually, you know, interface with the, the state traceability API. Okay. So the way the way I'm interested in it though is basically just trying to help people just have sort of a common way of talking about data, um, the data they're looking at. Um, so you know, so for example, like on the left here, you've got like it's essentially a sales receipt in leaf. And then, you know, here you've got, you know, a sales receipt on the right in metric. And, yeah. and so they're generally capturing the same thing, right? So you've got the time. So here we've got sales date and they have it in an ISO formatted timestamp. And then here we've got created at and I do believe you can actually pass ISO formatted timestamps. Um, but, uh, you know, the documentation, uh, you know, it says, you know, it should be in that format. Mm. Yeah, so you're already thinking along the lines of con data consolidation and aggregation. Exactly. And so basically, just for my, I'm just trying to create some standards here. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, and there's other um, efforts to do this. I should note there's um, Open THC and other groups who are trying to do sort of, you know, standardization in the cannabis industry. Um, but, oh, yes. Um, oh, this was specifically lab results. But essentially, it would just be nice yet yeah, to create models for these and like my formalization would be yes to, to go with the, the ISO. You know, you definitely want the ISO formatted timestamps. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not critical, but it's, you know, it just, I think it would be awesome to just have a, a standardized way to talk about cannabis data, even between traceability systems. So that way you could, you know, you could do analysis regardless of, if they're in Washington state or in Michigan. Right, absolutely. So um, Charles, one of the ideas that Keegan was sharing with me for my, my graduate project was possibly mapping um, THC concentrations in different products and relating that to sales um, to see if what the relationship is, um, is there any kind of correlation between that, those um, factors. Um, and so that was, that was one good idea. 
Um, and I'm definitely open uh, to other ideas as well. I, I just have to come up with something pretty quick. But if if you also, if you think of any kind of interesting questions, Charles, please let me know. But um, so, but the, again, the first step for me to do anything with this is time to kind of map out the data so I understand it, you know, the relationship and how I can pull the data that I would need for my analysis. So. Right. I started actually, I've started working on that particular problem. Ah, okay. Um, so... <laughs> one of the things you're going to run into is just the massive massive amount of data because you need the lab results you need the inventory you need the, you need the sales or yeah. <laughs> you need the sales and so i mean it's a it's a lot of data and so what i've been trying to do is get dask working um so that you know it Although what ends up happening is even with Dask, you still are, you know, you're, you're swap file bound and you're, and you're still, and if you don't have a lot of memory, then it spends a lot of time swapping between the disk and the memory. Um, I wonder if you could do um, some sort of uh, data sampling methodology um, as opposed to doing, trying to get it all just maybe do a segment of the products or um, at least a start. Uh, yeah, that would be a good approach. So Paul, here, whoops, I keep bringing that up. So here, here's actually how you make the connection. Um, you, in, you, you can do it more elegantly because I'm not sure how you're going to capture the, so basically, the things you need to capture are the quantity. So it's going to be a mess, right? Because uh -huh. so you've got a receipt here. A receipt can have multiple items, right? Because, and this is where you got into the basket idea. Because, you know, a consumer may buy... Um, you know, a soda and a jar of flour, or, the, you know, or they may buy two, two jars of different flour from two different um, licenses, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or two different cultivators. So what you're basically going to have to do is, you know, for each sale item, I would look at, I would aggregate by sale item. So just essentially think of every sale item independently. But they are independent in the sale items table. Oh, I see. Like the sales is just a total amount. Uh -huh. the sale items actually have the individual items. Um, oh, it's like a parent child relationship then. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that that was def that was one idea that we were talking about. Charles's um, market basket analysis, where um, you know the example is if I buy peanut butter and jelly, I'm likely to buy bread, right? And some of that analysis might be kind of interesting just to see what the product mix is of what people are buying. Yeah, uh, I don't know how you can, or I just don't know off the top of my head. Um, how to quantify it? I'm sure you can. We well, have to get the sale ID, or somehow the the sale ID I think is embedded in the sale items ID or in the sale <laughs> items table. Yeah, you have to link them that way, and then find everything that was sold during that uh, with that particular sales ID. Yeah, that seems to make sense. Okay, we have to take a look to. Maybe I'll start off with that one then, as, <laughs> as far as the mapping goes. You know, but um, you were saying that the uh, was it the uh, the customer or the member ID, or whatever the MMI, I think you were calling it. Um, that seems to be like the core ID in the whole system, the licensee ID. Um, so, oh, so. Here, let me just get this thought out and then I'll explain the ID. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
I was just thinking a way that you could actually quantify the baskets would be just do percent out of 100 of the different types of good of goods. So did this person buy 100% flour or did they buy or was their sale like 80% flour, 20% edible? Yeah, though they have in market basket analysis, they have um, something called support. There's like four or five metrics, um, and and you're hitting on one of one of them. One's called support. It's basically like a popularity measure. Um, there's another one called uh, lift, uh, and that's the strength of relationship amongst the items in the basket. So there's various different metrics uh, in market basket analysis that would kind of give us that picture. It gives you different. So you could have, you could have a combination that's very very popular, um, but it's weird. It's almost counterintuitive. But the the relationship amongst those those items in the basket may not be that strong. Um, you know, if I have a propensity to buy one, do I buy the other? So there's some interesting things relationships you can get out of that. But that's fascinating. You have are an, an expert on on this. So I'm I'm stunned. Um, so the, I want to learn a lot more from you about this because this is something that I'm interested in and I apparently, I don't know that much. So it's actually once, maybe next time we can go over some of it, um, but uh, it's actually not that difficult after you look at it a little bit. Um, it's actually one of the most basic machine learning uh, uh, algorithms that, that you use or not you use, but it can be used. It's just real basic. It's been around for a long time. Um, and one of the, <laughs> this sounds, maybe I shouldn't say this, but for this graduate project, I was looking for something that wouldn't be like too, too overwhelming because there's such a large time commitment in writing the paper and everything else that I didn't want to, you know, trip myself up and get into something that's really advanced that might be a real time suck. So I thought that this is something that could be useful. It's well known. It's not too complicated. Um, and it may be like a, a low hanging fruit for this data set. Um, so well, just something to, that I'm keeping in mind. Okay, yeah. Um. I'm glad Charles, you said about that sale, sale item relationship. That'll be the first thing I'm gonna go check out. <laughs> so, uh, uh, as far as mapping goes, but yeah, I mean, if you guys are cool with me taking a stab at some of the, uh, getting started with some of the data mapping, um, I'll be glad to do that. Um, but I, yeah, I probably will have some questions for you as I, if I get tripped up on anything. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, contact Keegan or me and, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll help you out, um, or try and help you out. Um, it's, it's a lot of data. It's a lot of information. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's it's hard to keep it all straight. So yeah, certainly that would be great. Okay. So just uh, curious about the connection may be a little choppy, but I was just going to jump in real quick um, and point you in the, maybe a direction connecting these IDs real quick. If that's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Right ahead. Yeah. Am I coming through okay? It chops a little bit, but for the most part, you're fine. So, am I still coming through okay? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll just try to power through this. Essentially, I was just going to say real quick that you know, we've basically mapped the licensee to the lab result. And then you can use the inventory ID. So you can use the inventory ID of the lab result to map that to the global inventory ID of the sale. Okay. So, that, so that way you've mapped the cultivator and the lab result to the sale item. So in the sale table, what was the one that maps back to the lab result? Can you repeat that? I was looking down, sorry. Yes. So you have the 
inventory ID mm -hmm. of the lab result maps to the global inventory ID of actually the sale item. I gotcha. Yep. And and what Charles was saying is you can actually basically use this. I think this is what Charles was saying. You can use this global inventory ID and then you could also potentially, you know, incorporate some other data points. So you could also maybe get look that inventory item up in inventories and then you can find out you know what whatever you, you know you could find out more data points about that inventory like what strain it is um let's see this this system is just a wealth for business intelligence isn't it i mean if you if you wrap your hands around this i mean you you'll definitely have the pulse. I mean, obviously, if you only get the day set once a month, but you'll have a pulse of what's going on in Washington State for sure, and that that could be pretty good for your company, I would think. Well, definitely, and it's one of those things where the data is sitting there, but it's such like a big pile of data, and it's coming out so fast that I don't think people have a great handle on it. So you do see companies out there that are sort of just just doing monthly totals so that and that's useful just to know okay you know what's the total sales you know each month um and so those are the big ones and like maybe the more ambitious people are maybe trying to do like average price but i don't even think people have that great of a handle on that maybe maybe i just haven't seen it but yeah, yeah. But the more in-depth connections, I'm not certain that, and that's why it's so cool working with it because you know we can be some of the first people to actually connect the the data sets here, and and yeah. really have a, have some real cool findings and or just some real interesting findings. And often all you really need to do is some conditional averages. Um, and you can, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, um, f like first mover advantage. So in your opinion, and for you as well, Charles, I mean, obviously you guys know a lot more about this than I do, but, um, it, would you say the, the data science slash analytics maturity level in the industry right now is pretty low then? So. Uh, there's not a whole lot of, I mean, it sounds like there people are doing some basic aggregation based on what you said, but there's really not much in the way of data science being applied uh, in the space. Well, so I th that's what, I, why I think there's a shortage. So it's being done. What I see is mostly just averages. So I'll see... I'll just see people just do monthly averages. Um, so they'll just they'll just do total sales by month. And then I they'll just almost just conjecture what they may be in the future. So mm -hmm. I, I rarely even see like formal forecasting models. Um, and then I think like the con I, I take that back. They're starting to there are some companies I see that are starting to do a bit more in-depth analysis of sort of consumer sales. So they're saying, oh, so they're saying, oh, you know, the, the average consumer, maybe they're 60, 70% male, you know, mm. 30, 40% female. And so that's where, so I think they're starting to get there. And so that's where I was talking about sort of the conditional averages. I see. Um, and that's sort of, I think, where you start to get into the, the the better insights is, you know, instead of just doing monthly sales, 
you know, do sales by um, mm-hmm. X. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, instead of monthly sales, do sales by flower versus concentrate. So you're starting to get there. But then like the like the analysis you're doing where you're actually saying, okay, does lab results, do lab results ha- have an effect on sales? I don't think, I haven't, the only people who are doing that sort of research are like the academics. Um, I hmm. And like I said, it's in high demand. Everybody wants to know those sort of questions, but there's just a shortage of, of data scientists and right and people that have time to to wrangle this stuff so that's yeah. why it's just such a good opportunity yeah the wrangling is the the, the biggest part and um so it, the, like there's univariate type statistics out there summary statistics you kind of talking about like some multivariate stuff this versus that um, but it sounds like there's really n- no kind of like machine learning uh effort or that we're aware of anyway that's currently nothing like super public um i mean like i'm sure people are making their attempts internally at making like machine learning models and i've heard of like biotechnology companies um who are they're trying to maybe do like predictive analysis with cultivation but really really early stages so so i have one contact um so this is a bit of a stretch but my cousin's husband's brother (laughs) um i know he lives in chicago i know for a time he was looking he uh, worked for a hedge fund for a while um and then all all i heard was uh he was looking into the cannabis industry and this was probably about 18 months ago. That's the last I heard of it. Um, and I, I, so my guess is that investment firms probably have some quants that have tried to do some of this stuff. It's, you know, as far as trying to figure out if it's, you know, what the investment landscape looks like. Um, so those are probably one of the few and the academics that you mentioned, those are probably the few people then that probably have delved into it that much. And I imagine once they look at, some of the data wrangling um, and that it's not consolidated, you know, they're probably, it's probably not a comprehensive view, um, but that, I'm just kind of theorizing here, but those are probably the only folks that then have really probably dug into this that much. Exactly. The, the quantity, unless you were going to chime in, Charles. Oh, no, I mean, I really kind of don't know what other people are doing or what's going on out there. I mean, I'm just sort of doing this for, for an academic sense, not really like, um, you know, uh, but it would be nice to see what other people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at the very least, it's fun. So it's interesting. Exactly. And there's so many avenues. And I was just going to chime in that I think the quantitative guys, they're, they're looking at stocks and sales. So I think there's a ton of interest in like consumer sales. So I think they're starting to get a bit more advanced there, but like, and, but I think people are just barely scraping the surface with sort of cultivation analytics Mm -hmm. and then just the market analysis as a whole. There are maybe some people taking a stab at it. um, And then of course the academics, but a lot of times they're just late to the game. Um, They maybe don't have the, best inside knowledge of the industry that be great because there's a lot of like combining data sets you need to do but so i'm not certain um but like i said it's it's crazy because it's just all this data is just sitting there on the table um so yeah that's, that's there's a lot of opportunity for sure to do some digging around and find out some interesting things so um I will share some things that I've learned from digging through this data. One, there are a lot of there's a lot of records that have dates of one one nineteen hundred. Okay. <laughs> um, 
basically, I think everything, bef anything that's like dated before April of 2018 is kind of messy because there was sort of like, like apparently there was some sort of system conversion. And so a lot of stuff that was from before 2018 is crammed into the first couple months of 2018. So you'll get some, there's a lot of outliers. There's a lot of really off the charts results. And then it sort of stabilizes after that. So some data um, quality issues then. Yeah. Um, oh, I feel like there's something else I have to tell you, but uh, let's see. I mean, those are two of the big, oh, the other thing is data isn't necessarily recorded in real time. Like I think some things enter their data every day, some every week, some every month. So it's kind of hard to do a time, any sort of time series analysis. I see. My, my two cents on those is you may want to exactly restrict your analysis to either after 2018 or after April of 2018, because that's sort of when the traceability was formalized, but look at your data and make your best judgment. And then, um, well, what was the second point, Charles? Real quick. Um, it's not recorded. It's not recorded uh, at the oh, same time. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, a lot of the times, I find uh, weekly analysis real interesting because you still get the dynamics. Of, you know, a bit more you know, diamond dynamics than like a monthly series, mm -hmm. but then you don't get this noise that's present in the daily data um, where right. you may have these unnatural spikes where like Charles said, maybe everybody just does all their data entry on Monday or, yeah. you know, but maybe that's not when the sales actually happen. Sure. I, I that makes a lot of sense because well, the, one of the first things that I was, felt when I was reading through this, I thought, what a what a um, business burden for the, these these organizations, right? To have to actually <laughs> do all of this work, right? All this accounting for the government. And that's just a, that's a lot of time, a lot of effort. So if they're going to figure out ways to make it as easy for them as possible to, and batch their submissions, I'm sure that's what they're going to do. Well, you've You've hit on essentially what Canlytics is all about. And so, and not just Canlytics, but many software companies out there. And so that's one thing, it's, it's incredible. You know, you throw these companies a challenge and they just, you know, there's companies that rise to it. So there's basically, you know, software companies that specifically just essentially try to make interfacing with the traceability system easy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they often have to, have some sort of like ERP aspect, they, you know, some sort of value added. And then, because you're right, it's either that or, you know, sit, sit your employee down uh, to do some data entry. Right. So. Is that, so from the analytics perspective, is that the space that you're most interested in right now is like how to facilitate making these guys' lives easier? Well, essentially so. Right now, we're, Canlytics is verified in Oklahoma, so with metric. And mm -hmm. so the idea is, so, you know, the laboratories need to operate and, you know, they need to comply with traceability. And at the end of the day, the producers need to just, they care about getting their products tested and then sold. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, need to comply with traceability preferably as an afterthought, right? They don't want to spend all day worrying about that. Sure. And, and so, and that's sort of what Canlytics does is so you sort of leverage the API so that way, you know, the data just flows nicely through the whole system. So you collect it smoothly, you, you know, create your certificates, it goes up into the traceability system. They, Cultivators, gotcha. processors receive it, and then they can, you know, have the results in their system, sell it to the retailer. Everything's just move it, moving along smoothly. 
um, and then they can sell it. And, and so that's the ideal world um, that we're you know trying to move towards. And then we're just trying to you know iron everything out, help help those that are forced to still do data entry because I've been there, and I don't think anybody. Uh, does, you know, no one deserves to be doing data entry, so we're trying to solve that problem. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, that's a great spot that you're in then because uh, uh, you're just trying to make the lives easier for the businesses. Yeah, they, they just want to have a quality product and you know make sure it's following the process and they make their money, right? So you coming in and kind of greasing the skids for that process, is uh, that's a great spot to be in, it sounds like. Just trying to help. Um, because, you know, like that's what I've learned and there's just so much help that and value that can be added there because, you know, there's some people that are figuring it out. But, you know, when you start talking to people, there are a lot of people that are frustrated with it and they are doing a lot of unnecessary data entry. And I, it can only it can only help. Right. And then it, it's, it has a ripple effect. Because, you know, if all of a sudden they're, they don't have that burden of data entry, they can spend that much time to make their business better, have better operations. Yeah. Is there, do you know if um, the state agencies, especially like Washington or Oregon, do they uh, have like auditing where you have to go into different maybe labs or producers or whatever, and they have to be audited for compliance. So that's probably a state by state basis. I think they essentially, I'm sure they do sort of spot checks. So from, I don't actually know too much about like the actual enforcement side. So like for, like for example, pesticide testing in Washington state, it's one of those things where you have to comply with the regulation so you can't use unregulated pesticides. But they're currently just, it's one of those things where basically if they showed up at your facility and tested your product, you know, you could get, you could be, you could um, be in violation of the regulations. But I don't really know like if they're like, if they have a schedule that they're going about and spot checking or if it's random or if they just do it, you know, if they suspect there's a pesticide being used and that's just Washington state. And so I really think it probably varies state by state. Um, I just heard secondhand that, uh, Like in Oklahoma, they basically just pick random samples off of the shelf to get retested. So mm -hmm. that's okay. sort of a form of auditing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. It, it's interesting to see what kind of um, maturity level the industry's in. It just seems like it's, well, it's all just getting started, really. So I had read in Oregon that if, if a producer goes to a lab and their sample fails, they'll take it to another lab. And basically labs that fail products just don't get any business. And the ones that just pass <laughs> products get no business. And so there's this pressure on labs to just pass things. Oh my word, yeah. So who's who's testing the testers, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Interesting. Okay. Well, it, correct me if I'm wrong. So in Oregon, you do have mandated pesticide testing. Do they also have mandated the metals or it's you know it, it, everything in oregon right it's the strictest you know uh -huh. testing it's you know it, it every, you know we're everything from you know from the seed to the sale is is tracked and and we have the most you know the strictest testing standards and stuff but i don't believe any of it um because you know i i especially after reading stuff like that i mean it seems like um, there's a, there's always a way around it, and that was one of the things I looked in Washington. There's there's very little retest data. Like that table is almost non-existent. Mm. Interesting. Yes, I I hadn't even looked at that data. So, yeah, so that yeah, so that's worth a, a look. So that's interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, um, could you imagine if Canalix had a white paper about retesting results, right? I mean, that uh, that would definitely get you some attention, I would think. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't know. That's that's something I read in the news, the the, the you know the local newspaper. Um, so it would be interesting to, to find out. Um, actually, there's a lot of you can find you can you can actually come up with a lot of good project ideas from reading the newspaper. Yeah, um, there's one about like sales along the Oregon Idaho border because it's illegal in Idaho, but it's legal in Oregon, and like. You know these little these little towns have these this huge per capita spending on on, on cannabis, uh, much larger <laughs> than the larger cities because people are coming across the border. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. This is all part of the story that could be told, right? I mean, uh, yeah, it's interesting um, stuff. But so, but first we just have to get a handle on the data. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the data yeah. always comes first. So I do have to drop off here. This is oh uh, yes, yes, my, we've, my, we've, we've overstayed. But no, no, no. It's my my lunch break. I'm supposed to be working, but um, uh, <laughs> this is more fun. Um, so uh, I'll start uh, doing trying to do the best I can in the mapping. Um, I'll touch base with you guys before we meet again, just to let you know where I am. Um, right now. Uh, what kind of project I'm gonna do for my 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 schoolwork? I'm not exactly 100% sure. I think it's gonna be really low hanging fruit on what data seems to be present itself to to pull together most easily. I think that's probably gonna be the driving factor. But um, yeah, I'll take a shot at doing what I can for the mapping and reach out to you guys if I have any questions, and I'll give you a little update. I'll probably beginning of of next week or something like that. So. Okay. Awesome, Paul. It's been fun, and I like your ideas. I think it's gonna be incredibly helpful. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And it's great meeting you, Charles. And um, I'm looking forward to tell my wife that <laughs> I met a guy in Oregon who's from Roseville. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great meeting you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. All right, everyone. It's been awesome. All have, right, a, have, a, yeah, have a productive week. All right. Take care, guys. Talk to you later. Bye. See, bye. See you, Charles.